Welcome to an episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you won't miss a new episode. I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, and today I'm delighted and privileged to have a conversation with Indy Gregg. Hey, Indy, welcome to the program. Hi, pleasure to be here. Allow me to introduce where you come from. You are the founder and CEO of Wido, which we see in the background. You're the CEO and founder of Digital Unicorns, the non-executive director and founder of Cosmetic Laboratory in Europe, founder board director of Kershunz. You are a singer-songwriter with uh, an album out. You're born in the US, but you live and work in the UK. Indy, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. <laughs> now, what's for me quite obvious, if I introduce you, introduce your background, seems like you, you like to create. If it's not a song, it's companies. Absolutely. Okay. Creativity is, I think, what we're, we're all born to do. And I think we're all creators. Uh, whether or not we believe we're creative or not is really more of a frame of mind. But we're all creating everything we do and everything we see you know, on a daily basis, annual basis, year to year basis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. Okay, got that. So, uh, and this actually, I mean, I'm assuming a, a link between your background as a singer songwriter and the board director of Kershunz, uh, but I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later because singer songwriter, was that uh, a professional ambition or an outgrown hobby? What, uh, what was it for you? It wasn't an ambition at all. Um, to be to be quite frank, I was in the more digital arts. I'd always been a musician, and um, I lived in the south of France. And I'd been working at, um, with Sony Digital and quite a few other clients at the time. And I had an opportunity to go record some songs, and so I had a backlog of a lot of songs uh, at a recording studio nearby. And I was working, doing some, you know, odd jobs at at the studio. Uh, just for fun. And then, um, you know, my marriage broke down, my husband left me and I had three tiny babies um, that weren't very old. Um, the oldest was around seven and the youngest was pretty much almost just born. Um, and I decided, okay, I'll become a professional artist. And I just went shopping for a record deal. And lo and behold, uh, I know it was crazy at the time, but I got one. So uh, that gave me the opportunity to uh, bring my kids with me and uh, record an album and go on tour um, professionally under a label and have a, you know, label distribution and everything. So it was just, uh, it wasn't planned. It wasn't planned. <laughs> well, sometimes it happens. Uh, uh, by the way, the, the songs you wrote, uh, are they about your personal experience in life? What, 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 what kind of topics did you cover? Um, lots of songs uh, about uh, really mindset more than anything and how we see life. Uh, a lot of that was just observations about the world, but uh, also from a personal perspective, you know, um, like Sweet Things is really about how if you're looking at a particular a problem or need a solution and you look from kind of get outside yourself to look in on what's going on uh, you can observe that there is a lot more silver lining than there is clouds sometimes um, I guess that that's really the objective of that song it's kind of just to remind people that the, the things that really matter most in your life uh, are the ones that a lot of times people ignore uh, yeah, and so the album was called Woman at Work, um, and a lot of the songs are really just about decisions we make in our life path uh, more than anything, yeah. <laughs> or decisions which have been taken for you sometimes, what you just shared. Yeah, well, decisions can be taken for you, but I think that you, you know, you, sh you show up to life as a player yourself, right? You're part of, you're part of the action no matter what happens. And we know that, and um, yeah, life reveals itself as we move along in our thought processes. And some of those things are great learning curves for what what's to come in the future. So, <laughs> okay. Now, all those companies 
you founded so far. Um, what drives you to found a company? Hmm, I think it's more based on being able to help people um, and, and usually the knock-on effect of how, how what a product or service can do to help those people help more people. So for example, uh, with cartoons, there was a real problem in the music industry. So yeah. the, the intention was to create an environment for the artists themselves where they could take charge of their uh, craft and, and be able to do deals uh, during a period when the record industry was collapsing. Um, with Cosmic Lab Laboratory of, of Europe, it was to enable professionals to be able to have access to a particular set of goods, which were nail polish, and in order for them to serve their clients. So it was a B2B play. With We Do, it's about, again, helping more people help more people, how you can leverage uh, technology in order to uh, create spaces that remove the barrier to entry for a business person, a solopreneur, or a small business who sometimes don't have access to tools or there's a paywall um, that keeps them from uh, creating the, you know, the side hustle, the solopreneurship, the coaching or consulting gig, the small business that they want to create or even a startup. Um, and so we have created tools, uh, financial tools, as well as invoicing and communication tools all in one platform. Okay. And that's the, the, the impetus is that, you know, that we, we have a social obligation to remove the barrier to entry for more entrepreneurs so they can fulfill their purpose. We're definitely going to call a, uh, a cover uh, we do. But before we get there, I want to go back, go back just a little bit, because I mean, all the companies you founded, uh, it is about empowering uh, people. Uh, and is this also about personal experience? I mean, you were a musician. Uh, maybe you were buying um, nail polish. Hey, is that a cosmetic laboratory? Um, and the same with Vidu. I mean, is it your personal observations? Hey, I don't like what I'm seeing. I need to do something about that. Yeah, I think there's a conviction. Convi okay. um, when you see a problem that hasn't been solved or you see uh, areas where it can be improved, I feel like there's a personal ob ob you know, obligation to create a company or create a solution to that problem through either technology or a product or service that either doesn't exist in market. In the case of cartoons, it didn't exist. Um, yeah. And cosmetic lab, it didn't exist either in market for your average consumer. It was all professional based. So I think that's probably a big yeah motivator for me is to solve okay. a problem in the market that helps people get the job done. And sometimes that comes through personal frustrations, of course, especially with We Do and, and Cartoons, those two, it was like, okay, this isn't fair. This isn't right. You could see where the market was going and heading and you go, okay, if I don't do this, what's going to happen? And sometimes you can create new markets that way, which was the case in, with Cartoons and it's probably going to be the case with We Do. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, um, would this, would this also be advice to those listeners out there who want to start their own uh, organization, found something, uh, look what frustrates you and see what you can do to improve? Yeah, I think that's one way of problem to solve. And, you, you know, you're either solving a problem for yourself or for a client that you know mm -hmm. that this could be improved or, or made better. Um, in, in general, no matter what your product and service is always based on you're solving a problem for something, for someone. In, in most cases, unless it's really pure fashion and everyone has clothes and it's just a matter of making it cooler or, or more whatever, avant-garde or whatever you want. But in general, in technologies uh, in particular, um, the technology needs to serve people. Uh, otherwise, you don't have a market. So if you just got an idea and you think, oh, I'll just you know go make this thing and you don't know if there's going to be any demand for it, you're not solving a problem, it's not going to go very far generally. You know. uh, generally, although there are exceptions, uh, big ones like the iPad, where we did not know we needed it, and we all bought we all bought one. Well, so we still those, don't know if we needed it. I mean, we so, you know, okay, but, but we haven't, we haven't. <laughs> that market was created. But in your case, your advice is uh, observe, see what frustrates you, what frustrates the people around you. That's might be where the opportunity is. Sometimes there's yeah, I think sometimes there's an opportunity there. There's also opportunities for innovation, of course. Uh, especially in uh, digital spaces uh, when you can kind of see where you can better 
a product or community, you know, it does, it could be a problem that's already solved, but you can make it a lot better through a new technology, for example, 3D, yeah. 3D technology, or I don't know, holograms or, or whatever that future forward innovation might be. Yeah. Okay. Now trips to space, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Now, now it's time to move to we do Like I said, that's not just uh, an app on a phone. Well, it is a, a, just an app on a phone, but it's not just an app. Uh, in the sense, uh, first of all, maybe explain uh, exactly what does we do offer. Absolutely. So, uh, we offer we offer get to give you back your time, your money, and your heartache more than anything. Uh, really, to be able to remove a barrier for people. So we allow video and audio spaces that you can um, broadcast to up to a million people per mm -hmm. channel. We call them alleys. Uh, you can do one-to-ones and take an instant payment. You can sell tickets. You can send invoices. And we issue you a debit card so you can also do your banking processing with us. Uh, you can pay your clients and, uh, or sorry, your, your, your uh, employees or your contractors through it. And we automate the contracting procedure and the invoicing. So you can basically do just about everything you can do on a social media uh, site mm -hmm. uh, and take instant payments through it on demand in real time. Now, what is fascinating about this initiative, there was, you started this right in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. Yeah. Everybody was at home. We could not get together. So was this just you sitting in your home and say, look, I need to do something. Uh, and then when you do that, how do you find people around you when everybody's stuck at home? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess... I guess for me, the initial thought process of this happened in 2019, and I'd already started to iterate in, in, to some extent, but yeah. my mind was more geared towards the events market than it was actually solving a problem for the independent solo, lo, solopreneur or the freelancer or, you know, what have you. Along about March of 2020, when I realized we'd be in lockdown, I thought, right now, this J curve that I've been watching of the yeah. gig economy is going to go shooting straight up. It's it's inevitable, and then the market's so big that you need you know we're going to need a lot of support for it. So mm -hmm. that's when um, the the development phase began in terms of iterating the ideas, making sure the model made sense, and and moving it forward. And so I had a pal that I'd worked on uh, worked with on a, a project prior, who happened to be the first CFO of PayPal, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, I'm in, I'll come on board. And then after that, it was really going through a, a list of people that I'd worked with before and to see if what their availability would be and whether or not they would go through a sweat process with me uh, in order to bring this idea into fruition. And that's what we did. So finding people was really, you know, hey, hop on a Zoom call. Hey, yeah, you know, okay. typing away on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn and seeing if they uh, would be part of this movement, you know, to help propel society into an age where uh, it wouldn't matter whether or not there's a pandemic or not, we can still conduct business, we can still innovate. And, you know, that kind of silence that was going on in everyone's mind, um, a project like this kept their minds busy. So the fear factor was, was put to the corner while the rest of the world was glued to their television to see how many people were dying of COVID and what the solution would be we thought we'll just get busy and work in isolation ourselves and created a kind of a community around the idea uh, and a team formed. And we now we have uh, 25 people uh, fast forward two years working uh, on the project with us, uh, plus an exterior kind of family of advisors and coaches and a board and um, whatnot. So we've we've grown quite a bit since then. Well, uh, congratulations there, starting this in uh, 2020 to get there. Now, um, could you estimate a percentage, how many people you uh, approached, accepted a, I'm in, and who said, no, uh, I find this too scary? Actually, I can't think of anyone who said no uh, at why, that time. Do you have an idea why that is? Uh I, I think probably approaching people that trust uh, yeah. 
we've worked together before. Um, there's trust there. Uh, they were in a position in their lives or in their career where this is a, a thing they were looking for. And I think also some of it might just be fate because some of it's unexplainable. I think sometimes it's energy more than anything else. You don't, you don't have all the answers to the questions, but once you take decisions, things start to come into fruition. They start to grow, okay. I guess. <laughs> and then um, around this uh, issue of trust, uh, do people trust the idea or do people trust you as a person? I think there's a combination of both. I think that uh, when you formed relationships in the past and you've had uh, respect for one another, or work together on a day-to-day -day basis, there's an automatic trust that, that comes from that, from the experience of knowing, hey, I know this animal I'm working with. Yeah. I know who this person is. I know I've worked with them before. They've, we've, we've had a relationship or a friendship or a, a, an encounter uh, from a work point of view in the past. And that helps a lot yeah. in choosing okay. the right personalities even to put into a group together. Yeah in order okay. to innovate so and uh, do you have any idea or no, no can you uh, put in words what you need to do to gain somebody's trust how does it look like i think show up when you say you're going to do what you do what you say you're going to do um consistency is a big part of that um being uh someone that is reliable mm -hmm you know, um, and communicative and a listener who understands uh, and respects the other person's point of view. I think all of those things are extraordinarily important uh, when you're choosing people both on your team and then how you act in a leadership role yourself. Okay. And do you get coached, by the way, by people? Do you have a sounding board? Like, I, I'd like to discuss with people what, I, what my next step's going to be or some brainstorm on ide ideas? Absolutely. I do that with uh, our board members. I do that with um, my personal coach, uh, who's uh, he's really a scale-up coach, but I talk to him anyway to bounce mm -hmm. off even early stage yeah. ideas. Um, and then, yeah, I have a board of advisors, and they each have uh, skills that are very diverse from from one and one to the other, uh, which means that I can tap into knowledge when I need to. That is always helpful, and it's the same with the team. None of us look alike. None of us have the same skill sets. We fill uh, various skill sets, and we're different than each other. In fact, we're so different in terms of race, color, religion, creed, and and and, and sex. And there's a, a massive diversification in this team. And I think if you're going to solve problems for the world, you need to have the world in the team solving those problems with you. So when you built your team, this was a very conscious effort to have that inclusive approach. Absolutely. Got that. Now, I also saw that uh, only 2% of the women get investments, but you managed to break through the glass ceiling. Uh, any idea why you succeeded where a lot of those other great women fail? Any idea? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I think it's persistence more than anything. Yeah. Um, you're going to get a lot of no's in life in general. Yeah. And yeah. there are some, uh, there are some bits uh, in life, parts of life where it's easier for women, for sure. And there's some areas of life which are more difficult and women in technology happens to be one of the more difficult ones, but it's really difficult for everyone who goes out to raise capital and especially during a recession or a uh, period like COVID uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty, it's especially difficult. So you have to prepare your mind to break through all of the no's until you find the yes. And you always have to consider it's the next meeting, I'll get a yes. Then it's the next meeting. And don't rest on the idea that, oh, that was a disappointment brush it off, go to the next one, go to the next one. And it's really a, a numbers game to find people who align with you. In some cases, you may be lucky. In our case, the first investor uh, who was a pre-seed investor, the first person I even talked to about the project invested. Actually, the first two people I talked to about the project invested when it, when it came time to uh, raise investment. I also think that the first time founders make a very um, common mistake of asking for money too early. 
before the idea is fleshed out and before there is some form of traction. And by traction, it doesn't mean you have to have thousands of people in a wait list. It doesn't mean you have to have the full uh, app built or the product completely done. But what you do need to have is a good plan, uh, a good, uh, a reasonable um, set of you know dates where you're going to hit certain goals and an understanding of how you're going to return that money to the investor in the future. Because basically your money's on loan to the investor and they're looking for a return on their investment. And a lot of first-time founders are so eager to get their project started that they run out and they suddenly get no's and then they give up. Um, and then another thing I think particularly with women is that sometimes the vision isn't um, necessarily scalable and they don't really have the, the team around them um, where men do uh, to really get that point across. And unfortunately, uh, the vast majority of investors are men. And so you really need to be able to uh, frame your idea in a way that men can understand. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> and women communicate differently than men. So uh, there, there may be some, some connection there. And the third thing is there are less women actually going out to raise funds at the moment in general, and we don't have the 30 or 40 years of experience uh, doing that, especially in technology. So there's probably several reasons. It's not just a gender gap issue or that there's some sort of misogyny going yeah. on or, you know, it's yeah, no, there are practical reasons that yeah. for, for the percentages being so low. But do you see it changing for the better? I see it changing a lot. I see a lot more women uh, in technology. I see uh, the next generation, a lot more women involved in product and development, a lot more women who are involved in innovation and technology and the, 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 the businesses that scale, um, you know, besides uh, sewing and fashion and art and music and these things that a lot of women were funneled into in the past, that's changing dramatically. So we'll see a lot more balance, I think, in okay. these in these yeah, uh, let, let's hope so now yeah. i've also noticed moving on that you actually got a lot of free publicity interviews with forbes cnn nbc um on we do uh, how did you manage that um well we started very early so in 2020 we started putting out um, blogs and talks and uh, getting posts on various social media and creating those posts and building up a presence um some of that comes through um, people we know, connections. Some of it comes through PR uh, agency. Yeah. A lot of it is putting as many press releases out, out as we could to, to get our news across to people. Um, and uh, part of that's probably from track, track record from the team itself. Um, Forbes uh, has uh, given me the opportunity to be part of their council. So I'm part of the Forbes Technology Council, uh, which is helpful because I can you that know, very helpful, contribute yes. that yeah. way. Uh, but you know, paying attention and uh, getting the message out to the right people and helping, helping actually the journalists. Because journalists, I think this is something about PR that's a good trick for people. Every founder should know this and every CEO should know this. And that magazines and newspapers and radio shows and hosts and television shows and hosts, they all need something right, which yeah. is called content. And so if you're able to answer questions for journalists, um, like Twitter, there's a PR thread, there's loads of places where you can put in journal requests, um, it, you can help them fill up that content. So they need you as bad as you need them. In fact, I would argue they need us worse than, you know, <laughs> so uh, that, that's actually a very good uh, lesson to share with the audience indeed um, how you approach them help them do their work and you probably uh, get what you want absolutely now, <laughs> now, I understand you run your company remotely and you allow your employees to be autonomous you, you don't want to be a manager so two questions here how do you align people and how do you get them motivated 
well, I look for people who are self-starters in the first place. So they're really passionate about what they do and they're very eager yeah. to get out there and do that. So that's a, that's a really, in a remote team, that's really important. Um, another thing we do are daily standups. So five, 10 minutes, have a coffee together, talk about what we're going to yeah. do, at, you know, at the beginning of the day, if you've got a problem, you know, talk yeah. to the person in your team that, that can answer that problem and communicate, you know, okay. throughout the day. And then by the end of the day, did you meet your goal by the next morning? This is what I'm doing today. And you can move the ball forward that way. Um, people are more motivated than you think uh, when it comes to. Sorry, I'm killing a call. Yeah. <laughs> um, people are more motivated than you think if they're put in a situation where they feel empowered and they have responsibilities and they're accountable. So uh, it makes it easy if you set a goal and they want to reach their goal and they're motivated to do so. And then you celebrate it. Um, so, that's another thing. Okay. Uh, so this is your vision of the future of work. I mean, is, is we do an example how, how you think work is going to be uh, developed in the future? I think work has a lot of different, um, how do you call it, channels. So first of all, like in employment, if a, a lot of companies now are, will be, you know, or in the near future, uh, will be running hybrid and remote teams and fractional teams. And if you can uh, save time and energy by providing communication skill uh, tools through technology for people, it means they're spending less time. Uh, running their motors on the freeway, right? And waiting yeah. to get to work or on buses, yeah. on trains, you know, really things that suck from your time. The one thing that we take for granted, I think as human beings in general is that, that we think we have forever and we don't, right? Yeah. We don't, there's not that much time. It's a very limited resources, re resource. So if you can leverage uh, time and get more work done quicker and have the rest of your day free, yeah. Wonderful. Go play mm -hmm. in your garden. You know, so we have a policy that we do that you can work when you want, how you want, as long as you get your job done. You want to take four days off at the weekend because you're completely freed up and you're way ahead of schedule or you you've hit all your targets. Go go take the weekend off and enjoy it. Um, and then uh, balancing your personal life with your work life. Sometimes people think that's harder at home. There are ways you can frame that in mm -hmm. our company. We just encourage people to you know, take a break when you need to go for a walk, enjoy your day and get back on it. And creativity uh, and innovation has a lot to do with the pauses that we take rather than all the, you know, if, you, if you're going at it too hard, you're going to draw a blank eventually, yeah. right? It's like the writer, you know, he has to go out and spirit in its life before he can fill that blank page. So we believe that the best and most productive and creative teams are flexible. And yeah, I, I think that the future of work uh, so, revolves around a happier economy. And you're taking that very congruent approach. Practice what you preach. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Hey, Indy, uh, I, I love chatting you, with you right now. Uh, we're almost out of time, unfortunately. There may be one last question I want to um, ask you. Uh, first of all, what does success mean to you? I think success is... Um, reaching happiness. Uh, if we if we can have a profound effect on the quality of life through happiness, I think we'd have a much healthier society and a better a better world in general. More uh, cohesive cultures in our work. We spend so much time in our work that it seems like it seems like a no brainer to me. And why aren't we doing it? So happiness is a, a big one for the success of our impact as a company. And I hope that we make a, a big in, impact. Um, we're, we're hoping to reach millions of people and helpfully, hopefully help them finding their purpose and removing barriers and making them helpfully having an effect of, of more happiness and more free time for them. Great. Now, I'd like to end this uh, chat with you with offering you the opportunity to share your advice to those uh, young managers starting out their own, on their own journey, what would your advice be to these people? Leave home without your ego and really um, take time to uh, absorb all of the information that you can learn from and glean from people be open to change because 
we're going to be going through a period of rapid change in the near future and best of luck and happiness to you. Indy Greg, thank you so much for being on The Brand Called You. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.